crowd, well over 200 people have signed up for this, so we're thrilled at the uh, at the turnout. My name is Tommy O'Halloran. I am with Structured Zone. I am the Vice President of Business Development, and I am also the Vice President of the New York City Chapter of Cornet. Again, just asking everybody to mute their phones, please. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the New York City chapter, I want to thank our sponsor, uh, the Rockefeller Group, who is our learning sponsor for pulling, uh, for backing this. And uh, as for those that don't know, this is the Plugged In series, which is which takes place on Wednesday. And today's panel is part two of a two-part series that has been pulled together by the Strategy and Portfolio Planning Committee, which is chaired by Stephen Coldhart, who I'll hand it off to you shortly. And Stephen will discuss the uh, the panelists, what we're speaking about, address some of the unanswered questions from last week, which was great, and also available uh, on a recording. If you care to see that, you can get that at the chapter website. And with that, I'll hand it off to Stephen to go over some housekeeping and introduce our panel. Thanks, Stephen. Right. Thank you very much, Tommy. Um, so thank you, Tommy, and welcome all to the second part of SPP's Peace of Mind series. Um, Marissa, are we able to put others on mute? Thank you. So last week we focused on the initial reopening phase um, and the many management procedures being put in place today for the first wave of employees back into the workplace. Today we're going to fast forward 12 months and beyond um, to discuss what the workplace may look like in the future when schools have reopened and panic buying of toilet rolls and plexiglass has subsided. Given everyone's yeah, start point different, please don't expect simplistic one-size-fits-all copy and paste answers today, but as last week, you can look forward to hearing the approach that New York City real estate leaders are taking. Um, expect to hear views on the future of the workplace, the geography of the workplace, and the changes that are here to stay. That was Gary. Before I introduce the panel, could I please ask everyone to turn off their audio and video during the panel discussion? which will last about 30 minutes. And please, please, please use the chat feature to ask any questions you'd like, and we'll address them in the <coughs> second half of the session. So finally, I'll introduce our panelists today. Um, Andrew Burdick is Global Design Director at Macquarie Group, an Australian- He's coming up, he's got some presence here. Investment bank and financial services company. Paul Dara oversees Google's ever-increasing New York City portfolio. Tim Oldman is CEO and founder of Leasman, the world's most widely adopted employee workplace experience ratings and benchmarking tool. And finally, I will hand you over to Todd DeGarmo, CEO and principal of Studios Architecture. Over to you, Todd. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Um, I hope that maybe you got to see the first um, installment of this last week. It was really incredible panel. And it was very focused on opening day, getting back to work. And I think that really yeah, what came yeah. across in that is yeah. there was there were a lot of things that will need to be reinvented over time, um, a lot of room for innovation. And I think that's been, going to be a theme today is not what it was like day one, but what it's like 10 months from now and going forward. Um, There's a lot of discussion about individuals acting um, responsibly, that it's a different um, relationship between organization and employee, but that will be important. You know, you don't smoke in the office, um, you don't drink when you drive, you don't come to the office sick. There'll be a different, a different um, compact between employee and employer. Um, I just, the other thing is this group is taking a broad perspective as we, we speak. It won't be just focused on space because we all believe that certainly the IT digital part, the HR cultural part, if those don't, don't all work with space, that we won't be successful. Um, I'll, I'll build on what Stephen said. Don't expect cookie cutter solutions here. Um, I know at studios we have clients with different goals in different buildings. Some moving toward agility, they haven't changed that goal. If somebody was designing space to make sure it brought people together, they still have that goal to bring people together. So that's the thing. So I'm going to go right into the first sort of broad question, which is, I think on everyone's mind is, what will the future of office space be? And um, for instance, I, Paul brought up a great point. There's been a whole 
equity involved in the notion of everyone going remote and will we be able to perpetuate that? So I'm going to turn it to Paul first and then Andrew, you can just follow on Paul. Sure. Yeah, I think um, that's probably, a, a, you know, it's interesting. Google didn't have a work from home posture, although we had flexible work prior to COVID. Um, I think the amazing, you know, the, the fact that we were so quickly able to revert and begin to work from home was pretty amazing. And some of the findings of through that process have really been informative for us. Um, I think what Todd mentioned, which, and, and certainly being one of the people outside of Mountain View and dialing into to conference rooms in Mountain View, being a remote worker, as much as New York could be remote, um, it's interesting to see the, the sudden equity that everyone has because now you're part of a Hollywood square versus being the one individual dialing into a room of 10 to 15 people not being able to read the room and, and really kind of interrupting the flow of the conversation sometimes. So, so for us now, that's, that's another lens, right? So, so how do we make sure that when we do return to the office, whatever that looks like, and we enable more work remotely, um, how do we ensure that that happens vis-a-vis -vis technology, but also etiquette and cultural kind of cues that people then uh, begin to adapt, which, which I think is going to be a big part of kind of the next phase. Uh, certainly for everyone as we begin to, to return to the office. Andrew? Sure. So building on that and, and returning back to the, the first of the two-part question that you were, you were asking about, you know, sort of the role of, of office or the role of workplace is probably the better term to utilize. Um, you know, to me, there's always been this notion of there's a certain civic quality to workplace, right? Like just any, like any institutions, schools, uh, public spaces, et cetera, there's a sense of the, the camaraderie, right? the bringing together uh, a, sense of, a sense of shared identity, a sense of shared purpose. What's interesting about this, um, this uh, last eight weeks or so, um, at least in the conversations that I've had to date, is that there's been two key insights that I think go back to that. Uh, from, from the conversations I've had with friends and coworkers and, and peers, this sort of two kinds of connectivity comes up quite often in, in these conversations. And the one is the physical, the informal, the bump factor sort of thing that I, I think none of us are shocked to hear people miss. Um, and that's always, I think, been a key part of many great office environments that, that that sense of cohesion and connectivity of identity is sort of built into the DNA of the spaces that we occupy. But what's interesting now, if you, if you turn the question from the role of the office to the role of the workplace, it goes back to what you were saying earlier, that starts to have multiple facets, right? Physical space, the digital space, digital infrastructure, the culture, all of that together starts to speak to a couple different layers of connectivity and sense of purpose, sense of, sense of connection. And the second kind of connection that people have brought forward in these, in these conversations is how surprised they've been at the level of depth of connectivity that they've had with one-on-one -on -one conversations. And I think there's a purposefulness to the digital connection that we've been able to add into um, our day-to-days that people don't necessarily want to lose um, when we find this future balance between physical and digital. And I think that, speaking back to Paul, what you were talking about, this equity at the scale of a meeting, this equity at the scale of the whole organization, feeling as if you're a part of that grander purpose, I think it's going to be a balance of finding out how to harness that two, those two scales of connectivity, one very informal, one very purposeful, uh, that will um, be one of the great insights, I think, that comes from um, this, this global sort of experiment that we're all in right now. Kim, um, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. I, I, I think it's, um, I, my, my perspective is to be cautionary, I think, you know, we're, we're a matter of weeks into an experiment. Um, I, I think our, our technology colleagues have done an incredible job of making sure that in almost all instances, and certainly for every client, who we've supported so far through the crisis in our measurement, that technology is the one thing that hasn't fallen over. Um, technology is the one thing that suddenly we've equipped every employee with tools and uh, hard and software devices that um, they've, they've previously not had access to. So I think during this experiment, we are training and, uh, and, and providing access uh, to a different way of working that employees, many employees have never had the privilege of, of accessing before. So I think their expectation uh, will change over the course of this experiment and um, how they return to 
a corporate workplace and the expectations they bring with them is something we're going to need to measure and understand um, uh, you know, very accurately. But I also worry about, um, you know, we, we, none of us, I think, understand fully the duration of this test, this experiment, and, and therefore we need to pay careful attention to what is happening to some of those employees for whom this is new and fairly soon the novelty factor is going to wear off. So whilst I'd agree with Andrew that there is a, purple, a purposefulness and a, uh, a sort of structure to dialing into a call of this sort for employees who perhaps haven't experienced it before, I also fear that this sort of lack of serendipity, um, you know, which is not something you can diarise, not something you can schedule, um, the lack of that sort of secret sparkle of uh, fairy dust that an employee gets every time they come to the office and has that sort of, you know, that microscopic recharge of the corporate values and the brand values that an organisation has, all of that is gone. And we're only eight weeks in. And I think our sort of, uh, our esprit de corps has said that we'll just get on with it, we'll fight the good fight for the moment. But I think if, as the UK government announced here, it's going to extend its government support scheme until October this year, that suggests to me that city centre locations are not likely to be fully occupied before then. And that leaves an awful lot of employees out there by themselves for an awful long time. You know, earlier we had discussions about uh, traditional use of space like onboarding. Paul, I, I thought it was interesting, the discussion between you and Tim on that issue, just how we do that in, in this situation. Yeah. yeah. I, I, Go ahead, Tim. Um, I, I was just going just to, to echo that point that I think that, that um, every organization is different in this respect, but I think, you know, Google is typical, I suspect, in that many organizations that we're supporting are still onboarding people. They're still in that growth phase. The growth phase hasn't stopped and they would be very cautionary about putting a halt on it. But the knowledge transfer and, and that, that, that fairy dust that gets sprinkled on new employees is the one thing that we don't yet fully understand. But Paul, I think, is more experienced with that. I think that's right. We can onboard employees with all the tools. We can give them the protocols. But the hard part is to, to give them access to what the most important part is, which is the culture. And how do they assimilate in and become a part of the social nature of the work environment and not just the productive nature of the work environment, right? And I think the, the one thing which, Todd, you mentioned, and I think we need to be careful, certainly those of us who um, lived through 9-11, you know, the pendulum swung and we implemented a significant amount of security at the event of 9-11. And the same is true here. What is the pendulum that is going to swing? And then how do we, over time, begin to transition back to what the new normal will be? And it's going to be iterative and it will take time. And so how do we make sure that we're learning from each of these steps through the phases as we go through them to make the, the protocols we put in place that should be permanent, permanent? And what are the things that we may change and, and may flex over time as we learn more? And then, you know, I think also we can learn a lot from Asia as we look at how they've adjusted to multiple cycles of pandemic-like experiences and, and you know, kind of react to them in, a, in an appropriate way, um, which, which hopefully are all lessons learned through these, these next several months. So, um, Andrew, I, you know, when, this is one of the things that also was fascinating in our discussions was this notion of accelerated trends. What the, we were probably at the verge of a huge change um, in the workplace to begin with, and um, shifting demographics and shifting technology and shifting acoustics even, right? And so sure. I was wondering if you would just talk about that as an issue. So I, I think some of this goes back to, to Tim, what you were mentioning, there is this balance between this purposeful nature of some of what we're doing right now and this, uh, I like the term that you use, this fairy dust, that it is a bit hard to quantify sometimes. It is, it, I think it's very easy to qualify People know it when they're in it. When they're in a good environment, they, they certainly know it. Um, what I think one of the trends that we were starting to experience before all of this was this, this notion, I think previously, if you go back 10 years, I think there was very much this notion that you know, the digital was there to support the physical. I, I'm being quite broad in saying that. But I think in the last few years, I think part of a trend that we were starting to see was, wait, where, what, what is the relationship between digital space and physical space? And what this 
uh, current experiment has really, really broadened the height and focus is that actually it, it, maybe we need to be thinking about it in a slightly different way. The digital infrastructure, digital space, let's not even talk about just as tech, it's digital space that we're creating amongst ourselves, right? That, that actually may be the foundational piece and the physical is, is, is there to support it, right? Um, because if you think of it that way, it, get, it doesn't say that there's a one size fits all for any business. It says that the notion of flexibility should be there to support any business decision, any way of working that is good for the team, good, to, good for the person. I think that that trend is, has very much been accelerated simply by the fact of how many people are now working in a way that was different uh, than they had before. And they've seen both the good and the challenging in it. Um, and so therefore it will accelerate that question, whether it becomes a trend or not, I, I think is yet to, yet to be determined. And the second trend that I think is very interesting, this comes more from just one or two conversations with a friend that I had recently. Um, and this was someone who had been pretty, uh, you know, uh, relegated to a desk in many, many days. And he was saying there was two things he'd really taken away from this. One is that, of course, he could work from home. That was a, an epiphany, uh, personally. But the second one is that this, this notion of trend of, of, of activity-based or, or designing different environments for different activities in our workplaces, that, that was certainly a trend before, before all this. But a lot of people who hadn't taken, hadn't utilized that very much before are now seeing, well, actually, I do lots of different activities throughout my day. Even if it's in a home environment, how would I take that habit of looking for different nooks and crannies, looking for different contexts for my work to be done in? How do I take that back into an office? And to me, even though that was just one conversation, I'm starting to hear that in a lot of conversations I've had, that there are habits that people are forming that they will bring back into some of the trends I think we were seeing in physical environments. So those two things to me are actually quite an interesting and will have a pretty direct impact both on the digital spaces we create and the, and the physical ones moving forward. So Paul, I mean, at Google, where you, you know, you're in a tech world to begin with, I mean, is that, what is your view on, on that notion of accelerate trends? Um, the desk will no longer be a commodity in the same way it has historically. The types of spaces that we um, gravitate towards when we're in the office, if, if we can remotely work and be productive with heads down work, then the type of spaces we gravitate towards in the office are going to be more based on the social connection, team space, war room type environments where you can connect. And of course, we're going to always continue to um, leverage the technology to connect with, with people who are global in nature, who aren't in the physical environment we're in. And, and I think that will become more and more seamless. So the, the marriage of the two, but also the advancement of those is just going to continue. I don't think, you know, many of us probably five years ago, many, many organizations probably couldn't um, be as productive as we are today with the technology that we, we were um, operating with um, five years ago. And so imagine the future now will be shaped very much by this distributed workforce in the way we are. So, I think they're going to be run in parallel and advanced uh, uh, to, to actually inform each other as, as we continue, as Tim said, this experiment. Tim. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I think there's, there's a lot been said on, the, on it already, but I think what's, um, what, what, I, what I feel at the moment is the, the commonality actually in the, in, the, in the clients who've stepped forward and who have started to use our tool proactively already, um, all have one common feature amongst them, which is that for them, employee experience is uh, first and foremost at their minds at the moment. And it seems to have pulled together very swiftly some previously slightly less structured uh, collaboration between HR, technology, and real estate and FM professionals. And I, and I, and I wonder whether this, this crisis and this accelerated um, learning actually will do that for more and more organizations and, and firmly put the spotlight on the experience an employee has wherever they're working, be that at home or in a corporate environment that is fully under control or it's a remote semi-corporate environment or flex space. And also let's not forget on the commute between those spaces because for very many employees who don't have a private space at home to work from, their drawbacks to the office will be rapid once we're through the other side of this, uh, you know, and we start the long tail out of COVID. So, um, if we're looking a year down the line, I think we're going to be highly focused 
on the anxieties caused by the travel to and from work as much as we are focused on the experience in the workplace or the experience at home. So, you know, I think what, what uh, a trend that we've certainly seen is that you certainly don't have to all be together to collaborate. And so what's it going to be like when everybody goes back to the office and everybody's talking and, and in these kind of meetings? I mean, Andrew, you're, you're laughing, so I know you must have thought about well, that. Well, it's, it, 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 it fits right in with what we were talking about, about trends from, from before, before this certain moment. You know, acoustics, you mentioned it earlier, the acoustics are one of the key elements of a digitally connected world, right? Um, I mean, right now, how many of us are on an earbud right now? Uh, but how many people around us can probably hear the one side of what I'm saying, right? Anyone around me. That, that's going to compound, right? The, the more that we want to be very digitally and purposely connected with folks who are not necessarily right next to us, it's going to put um, a lot of uh, question on the physical environment that we're in. And that could be whether we're in an office or at home. That's going to be a major, a major physical challenge uh, that will just need to be all the more, um, what's the word, uh, developed from a design perspective. I mean, one of the trends we've seen in, in uh, the last month is, you know, I think when this thing first started, when the um, remote work started, um, we started to hear from our clients about a radical rethink of the office space, going back to almost um, backwards into the land of cubes. And, and uh, I think that when then we saw everyone say, you know, it took us a long time to get to the spot we're at, and we're, we're not going to go backwards. We're going to start from where our thinking is now and see how we can evolve that. I mean, Paul, do you think that's possible or do we need to think more radically about what the future environment might be? I, I think both are true, right? I think work from home for a lot of companies, if you think through IBM was mostly work from home until it became I'm by myself and then they edicted everyone came into the office. And so I, I think work from home sh will be a lever it, and it may be leveraged more now and, and be positioned to be leveraged more in the future. But I think the workplace is critical for, we're social creatures, right? We, we bring together and there's something that not everyone has a great environment to work from home from either. So does the job enable you to work from home more than one more than another? And do your individual circumstances, how do we give choice, right? The confidence of people coming back is going to be a, a big contributor to the timing and the approach we take. So I think there's so many factors, but I think, again, I worry we swing the pendulum versus it just becomes one of the kit of parts that we actually have to ensure that we make a productive workplace, workplace for people and we enable the right culture for, for each company. So, Tim, this wasn't a question we, had, we talked about before, but I, I'm fascinated by the notion of, um, this seems to have been a, a time when introverts were very, very happy. I have a number of people said, what's so bad about this? I'm not interacting with other people. I'm not being disrupted. I mean, do you have any thoughts about that and how we can learn from that part that it isn't all about collisions and collaboration? I, I, yeah, I think, I think Susan Kane has caused a whole load of real estate and workplace design professionals a whole load of problems with a, a, a binary proposition that introverts were like one thing and extroverts like another. Um, I, I, so I, where are we at? I, I, think, I think the focus will come back to what an employee does in their role. And, uh, you know, that somebody's character and their profile probably says something about the roles they're employed in. And I think what we're finding through the historic research that we've done, over 750,000 employees and over the contemporary research on home working, is that um, much more focus will be placed on, if you like, the value proposition to the employee of supporting them in the role that they're in. And so I think, Paul is right, I think we're going to see swings and roundabouts, there's going to be some workplaces transforming into different things. But I think this, this idea of, as, as, or of the workplace as a tool in organizational performance will very suddenly get very granular down to individual employees. And yes, so for an employee who exhibits introvert characteristics may find themselves being provided with a space that's better tuned to them. 
um, those employees who exhibit more extrovert uh, uh, behaviours may find that there are spaces that are better tuned to them. So I think it's a great time for design to get even more focused on the individual differences between employee, between groups of employees, between organisations. So I, I think that's, that's where my head is at on the sort of the, the otherwise very binary approach to introvert or extrovert. I don't buy any of that. I buy purposeful design for people in the roles that they're in. Okay, um, we, we're gonna do this uh, back for about 10 more minutes and we're gonna go to questions. But um, I think what I'd like to wrap this part up with is a discussion about how we're gonna have to change our processes and approach approaches in order to do, um, really deal with this change, huge change in our environment. Um, um, Andrea, I was particularly interested in your perspective on that. And then I think we want to wrap up also though with some discussions about what are some actual things that you're thinking about as far as food service or, or conference rooms and things like that. I think the audience really wants to know some of that also. Sure. Um, so to the process question you were, you were asking, I think it, it builds upon the last comment that Tim made, which is, you know, this is an opportunity to look very broadly at how people are supported. Um, and rather than lumping someone into a typology of how, you know, character or introversion, extroversion, the reality is that all of us do a vast, you know, a vast diversity of different tasks throughout the day. The, the process question is really, is, is an important one because at the end of the day, we have to understand who and how, who we're supporting, what they do, and and how best to support it. Right? That's a, that fundamental uh, side of this challenge is just understanding what is the actual question we're trying to ask and answer. And to me, uh, to, to the conversation we were having the other other day this week, um, the reality of that is the most important thing we can be doing right now is listening uh, and intently listening. I think you know designers are inherently can be inherently empathetic, which is good. But we also can can jump to conclusions like anyone else, right? Uh, based on a certain amount of data that we have at our at our disposal. And I think the reality is that the, the challenges that we are facing right now are far more complex than trying to take you know uh, one one brush stroke to all of it. It really is going to be back to what Tim said at the level of the individual and the individual team would be the other piece I put towards this that how teams actually function. Um, at, a, at, a, at a granular level will become a very key driver uh, as to how we develop specific um, answers uh, to that team or individual. And so to me, it all comes back down to a process that is human centric in, in nature. And that right now, what that means is listening, just listening intently and documenting as truthfully as we can to ourselves what we're hearing. Uh, because all of that information will be incredibly valuable to uh, all of our tasks moving forward. Tim, can, can you want to talk about that a little bit more too? Yeah, I, I think um, Andrew is, you know, we're at risk of vehemently agreeing with each other as a panel on every single question at the moment, but it's um, uh, the, 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 the active listening skills, the high empathy is going to be absolutely um, critical, I think to the, you know, what the workplace looks like in 12 months time. We have no idea if a vaccine is gonna be available. So there are gonna be anxieties that employees have about so many things to do with the workplace. Um, that, it, that, that, that that active listening capability of an organization and the professionals who represent everything to do with workplace um, is, is, is where it will fail or succeed. And I noticed one of the questions on already is around this idea of work-life balance. Um, you know, just being honest and candid about actually that um, our data suggests that it's one of the failures of this experiment. Now, that may be because we're all embargoed at home as well. So it's difficult to maintain a work-life balance when we're being told to behave in a particular mandated way. But the advocates for more remote working would have been um, shouting and hollering 12 months ago about the benefits of a better work-life balance if you work from home more. The, rate, the data that we've captured so far tells us that that actually is one of the pain points that employees are struggling to create boundaries and uh, uh, if you like a circumference to their homework in this environment. And actually it's, it's, a, it's a critical point potentially of failure. So I think having high empathy, active listening skills to what employees are going through during our return to whatever the sort of near normal looks like in the future is about some, uh, you know, sharing some knowledge and some um, uh, interest with colleagues around us from perhaps HR, 
from facilities management, real estate and design. Um, Paul, could you t uh, talk a bit about some things you that Google's actually thinking about putting into place or you have already have moving forward some changes for this? And Andrew, could you follow that up? And then we're going to go to some questions. And actually, the first one's going to be on that work-life balance. Someone wants to know a bit more about that. Sure. So I, so I think, you know, we're um, in the middle of a whole number of uh, tabletop exercises to understand um, upon initial return to office, how do we address enhanced circulation, right? Like all of the operational support that's needed. Um, we may likely be changing our food service delivery models, right? So there's um, very eliminating self-service. So, so all of those things, and if you think about it, one of the questions were about reduced footprint of real estate. When you factor in social distancing and enhanced circulation, it, it appears that we will get less people in the same amount of space, just given all of those factors. And so then how are we purposeful around the type of space and the utilization of space? Conference rooms densities will decrease. So, um, but I think more importantly from the, the actual physical aspect is the operational and safety. And I think, you know, having people feel comfortable that the space has been clean, that they have access into the building, that they're not putting compromised kind of positions of, you know, kind of moving through the building and into elevators, I think is, is probably the most challenging. The physical space we're gonna figure out as we start to slowly ramp up our occupancy over time. Um, but those are, those are the range of things that we're looking at and, and very much um, engaged on. Um, just, yeah, just to build on that, it, a sim similar comments in the, short, in the short term, you know, the, the reality is that um, hygiene and, and, and distance and, and comfort levels are all a part of uh, the initial rollback in, if you will. Um, and those are our are, are forefront in terms of how operations and things like that can, can move forward in the, in the shorter term. Um, I think some of the most interesting questions, or not questions, but conversations that are going on right now is back to what we were saying earlier. Um, what, what are the things uh, that we're hearing from our teams, certain habits, uh, ways of connecting that are actually working quite well, and how we learn from that element of it as we get back into a longer term, a longer term role in back in the office? What, what are those impacts going to have on the physical, the physical environments that we do provide um, when we come together. I think that that will be one of the fundamental long-term shifts um, in terms of the types of things we literally build out in our real estate. I don't have an answer to that yet. I think as Tim said at the very beginning, this is, this is eight weeks in. Uh, but to me, that is the most, in, as an architect, as a designer, that's the most intriguing question uh, starting to come out of insights from just personal one-on-one -on -one conversations with, with lots, of, lots of our staff and, and, and friends is you know, there will be potentially a different balance in how we support teams in both uh, a physically connected and then in, in, in a remote way. Um, I, I know that that's a, a, a bit of a vague answer right now, but I think it's more about the question that needs to be raised as opposed to what specific answer we're gonna have yet. Uh, well, that'll take some time. I went on um, off video for a while here because I was looking at the questions people are asking and I would say that they're um, not so many questions about bathrooms and elevators this time. They're pretty broad. I think you've inspired a lot of people here. Um, and so we're going to start to bring people on board to ask questions. But P. McCall, the discussion about um, work-life balance. And um, do you want to unmute him from your end so he can ask that question and maybe expand on it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. This, this is Patricia McCall with Rotate Studio. So I, I'm really noticing a lot of people working a lot of different time times, right? During, during the day, exercising in the middle of the day, being able to do different things. I also notice people working way more than what they had worked before. And so wondering just thoughts on work-life balance and how this new work from home thing for everybody could actually add more work-life balance. Just want to take that? Yes. 
Shall I start? Shall I yeah. carry on from where I left off? <laughs> carry on, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I, I think um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a critical point in the data that we're already seeing. Um, I think um, you know, if we think about the types of employees who've typically been um, brave uh, or, or, or you know, um, have been given this freedom to work from home historically, um, the probably the more mature in terms of disciplined uh, approach to being able to create parameters. And I think we're suddenly asking um, some very novice home workers to try and understand how to uh, impose some sort of discipline on their working day. So I, I, I um, absolutely echo that some of the many of the comments that we're hearing back from clients and through the survey results um, suggest that there are some risk points in not establishing those boundaries. And I know this is a very Amer uh, sorry, a very English sort of metaphor, but it was one I used the other day, which is it's a little bit like the difference between drinking down the pub with your friends and buying a bottle of wine from the uh, from the you know the, the, the supermarket and drinking at home alone. I think the, the thing about the, the social aspect of, of, of the pub is that actually there's some parameters. It opens at a certain hour, it closes at a certain hour. You go there for a purpose, you dress there for the purpose. Whereas at home, you don't have the burden, it's cheaper, but there are no parameters. And I think that's what we have to be very, very cautious of. For, for these novice home workers, we need to impose a lot of uh, support mechanism around them so that certainly those younger employees who very much now we, we, we detect are feeling like their career development is on pause, is on, uh, is on ice, don't feel like they have to work extremely extended hours so that middle management and senior management absolutely cotton on to the fact that they're contributing and they're putting in the effort. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really, really sensitive area, but it, it comes back to Andrew's point about you know, active listening skills, high empathy from middle managers and senior managers about um, you know, what is happening at a, at a very junior level. I think that's the, that's the grade that are at risk. Yeah. And Tim I, I building think the only other thing to add into that, which is we're also in a very restricted, like there aren't a lot of options besides work and being at home. And the restriction we have in place now, which hopefully will be lifted as things advance, will give people other outlets besides work. And so now there's a forcing people not to work is an important part of, of guiding people through this time, particularly for novices. I think you know, personally for me, I never thought I would say I missed my hour and 45 minute commute to get to the office, but it provided a structure to the day that now I, I don't have and I need to create in a different way. So I think for a lot of people that regimen and, and kind of separation from work from home is also important. And so how do people create that and, and enable the, 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 the distinct separation of work is going to be, a, a, I think, something for managers to help coach people on. Yeah. And back to the point that Tim was raising about, about listening at the moment, that I think that one of the biggest challenges right now is to try to separate the noise of the specific uh, COVID-related challenges, right? The, the isolation factors right now, et cetera, that are really additional stressors um, that they do create noise in the data that you hear, right? And it, it, how, 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 do we, how do we get to the bottom of what, what is being driven by that and what is being driven by the opportunity of working from you know, different locations? Um, until we can get to the bottom of that, I think it'll be fairly difficult to understand what is the long-term trend that we need to support versus what are the short-term things that simply, you know, need 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 cultural support and leadership support uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, as Tim, you're saying, uh, to folks who are just thrown into this for the first time. I think the, the, there's sort of two distinct questions uh, right now on the table. So um, I'm going to go to a question from Amy Parker. So Amy, you, can you unmute both your audio and your video? I thought it was a terrific question you had. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can't see you. <laughs> well, here I am. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm reporting in from um, Texas, uh, where I've been since mid-March. I came down um, for a quick trip and never haven't come back yet. So this is my new office. I'm working from home outside. It's about like 85 degrees. Um, and sometimes I wonder, um, you know, maybe I don't want to go back to my small apartment in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, and and that kind of relates to my question um, about the war for talent and cities as hubs for talent. Um, after COVID or as we start to recover 
And I'm curious if the panelists think that cities will still, like large sort of global cities, will still retain their position as talent hubs um, when employees can work from home and can work, have more flexible schedules. Uh, again, I think um, the point that many have made, but particularly just Andrew, separating the sort of like, you know, what's a sort of COVID recovery scenario versus a long-term working from home scenario. But, um, but I imagine that there is gonna be more flexibility, more working from home. And so I'm curious how that will affect cities. And also um, if, if you guys anticipate any shifts and how companies are gonna strive to attract talent when the physical office you know, is not available or is maybe uh, not a sort of day-to-day -day experience. Um, so yeah, that's my question. <laughs> Thank you. Who wants to take that? Shall I go first? Yes. Um, I, I can answer it very quickly, I think, from my perspective, that if, um, if, if you've never stood in one of Paul's reception areas, or you've never stood in a uh, Bloomberg, um, the, the sort of, you know, the, the sky lobby that they have in uh, Manhattan, or um, any one of those other um, talent spaces, those, those um, you know, it's not just fairy dust that's sprinkled there, right? It's full indoctrination of the value of that brand. And, and I think the, those, those headquarter locations, those buzzy spaces, um, are gonna be difficult to replace in the, in the outer, you know, the outer reaches of the empire. I, I don't, I don't cut it. I don't, I don't get it. I think, I think the attraction for those spaces is going to be still very, very strong, and it's going to be very influential in the talent war. And the last thing we need is for the talent to be attracted through an interview process and a recruitment process for those spaces, and then sent out to the second-rate environment in the suburbs. Um, well, Paul, I mean, I think maybe both of us remember when headquarters would go to Westchester County because that's where the chairman lived. So we have seen other phenomena. I wonder. What you, I mean, will we see more offices in Westchester again and Fairfield counties? So I think even after 9-11, that experiment lasted about three years before most companies brought everyone back into the city. Because, and I think it's not just working in the city, but it's the environment of the city that people thrive on, right? And, and so to the extent, again, I... I think people will have more choice now, but I don't think it changes the dynamic of the city and the multiple industries that pull from talent in the city. It's kind of where people want to be. And I don't know that COVID is going to change that dynamic. Uh, New York City, like many other cities, have survived many, many instances and, uh, and come back stronger. So I, I would say the city is still a big draw and a big source for talent. Yeah, I think the important thing to add into this, just from you know initial data of, of, of conversations, and Tim, I think you guys are starting to put together a larger data set around this, is that uh, for every, at least for personally, every time I hear someone saying, oh, actually, this is eye-opening, I can work from home, uh, that same person is often also saying, I really miss being able to run into my team. Right. Those, those, two converse, those two comments happen within 30 seconds of each other in most conversations I've had. And I think that that is the thing to keep in mind in all of this um, is that uh, I, at least I haven't heard anyone say that it's, it's, it's a one or the other. This is about learning what, what is working well right now and what are the real pain points and what are the things that we truly are missing um, as people uh, and as organizations the, the to me, the answer is not going to be at the extreme of, 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 of any sides of this coin or the, this equation. It's going to be about being very opportunistic about looking at what supports our people best. Um, and, you know, it's a question of talent. Usually, I think that the organizations that answer that question well typically draw incredibly smart and talented people uh, because it, it's not about a specific answer. It's about approach that says our people and what they do is valuable. And we will support that however however best for the team or the individual. I, I, that's a very broad answer, but I think that really is the, what leads to success um, coming out of, of whenever we come out of this. Um, Anne-Marie Fleming, I think there's a terrific question you have about um, a divide between those who work from home and ones who come to the office. I think building on what Paul said, I think that was one of the things that started 
to um, shut down the, the suburban offices. They weren't necessarily near the power structure, near where the way you get a promotion. It wasn't just the physical. So, um, Anne Marie. Thank you, Todd. Yeah, I really see this, and I'm not standing in Grand Central. That's just my virtual background. Um, but I, I spend a lot of time going through Grand it Central. Did bring a tear to my eye, though. Uh, <laughs> I do miss uh, that space. And yes. this is a lovely, lovely one. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I've worked remotely, um, virtually for six years. Um, I'm currently, you know, exploring where I go next, but you know, there is definitely a disconnect when you are a virtual remote worker and the people who are inside the office who get that face time with the leadership have a distinct advantage. So, um, you know, I think there is value to the opportunity and the flexibility to work from home, but I also see there, there is a danger and there have been studies and reports that back that up. So I'd love to hear what the panelists think about, you know, how to, how to bridge the, the balance that the gap between those who are working exclusively remotely and those who get the FaceTime. Thank you. Um, I mean, some of this goes back to, in my mind, the, that balance between how we design physical and digital space in tandem. Um, that uh, if we look at just at the level of meetings, um, I think all, all of us have at one point or another be, been the other who dialed into a room full of people. And, and certainly there's, there's a lack of equity in terms of how you experience that moment. Um, but similarly, there, I think that the real question for physical environments moving forward is if, if we are facing any reality where multiple people may or may not be in the room at any given time, that is something that has to, has to be figured out. And whether it's, it's a cultural question is that is the answer that everyone should always be on just a one-to-one -one screen, even if you're in the office, that, that maybe that's an etiquette question, or whether it means that the way that we um, support those kinds of meetings in a physical environment needs to be changed. Camera angles, backdrops, like why, why can't we all, you know, visit in a digital space that's been created that we, we go into? It, the, this is, a, it's a really interesting design question going forward. Uh, but I think it does go back to the, the initial question that Todd asked about just equity. Like, I think a lot of us feel equitable right now because we're all on an even, even playing field. We're all one of these, you know, pixelated squares on a, on a screen right now, uh, for better or for worse. Tim? I, I think Andrew brings up a, a really interesting point, though, about the five minutes before those people entered the room and the 15 minutes while they were leaving the room or a couple of the participants stayed in the room while you politely switched off your Zoom or team connection into that space. And I think there is so much that happens in the five minutes before and the 10 minutes afterwards that to Anne-Marie's absolutely valid point that you don't get any of that if you're the dial-in participant. And I, I think you know, that certainly those ambitious and creative and high knowledge transfer employees are gonna start really missing those five minutes before and the 10 minutes afterwards. So, Stephen, you've asked a question about end users. Can you? I think it's a good, straightforward question to ask at this point. Oh. Oh. Hi. So, yeah, just if if we talked about the war for talent and um, bringing talent into end users, what are end users looking for in the buildings going forwards? wants to take it yeah. <laughs> that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question um I, I think in many ways it goes back to some of this short-term and long-term uh splitting of that question um I, I think you know everyone's interested in health and hygiene and cleanliness and the comfort levels that can be you know provided in buildings um in in the shorter term in particular um I, I think there's there's a question long term about what will differentiate you know building building typologies you know and some of that will be at the infrastructural level of a building, um, just like in the 1920s what we saw a huge shift in domestic architecture right what was provided in in bathrooms and entry foyers and things like that and I wonder if there's a similar question being raised now uh, at a bigger scale of larger buildings um, moving forward and, and I'm not necessarily talking about retrofit I'm, I'm talking about a longer term question here you know how how do we provide uh, bathrooms in those shared facilities do you ever have to touch a door ever again um, you know that's an interesting question um, mechanical systems how, how do we 
how do we you know continue on the trend of providing really good light and air to people that was definitely a trend before before any of this how does this help accelerate that trend from a wellness standpoint um, to give the you know create the best uh, building uh, infrastructure possible i think those will be potential differentiators well, sorry steven you're you're muted Sorry, but specifically on the multi-tenanted buildings of New mm. York, where essentially the landlord is the front brand for a lot of the tenants. Do you see any difference in that? Because um, it, it, it just strengthens the role of the land, landlord's um, lobby space. I, I think, um, Stephen, one, one of the things that we're seeing through the data already, and, and I think chimes to an earlier point about the acceleration of trends. We know that employee awareness of health and well-being was on a you know, dramatic increase. We know the great work that um, some agencies have been doing about uh, increasing the value proposition to organizations of, of healthier buildings. I, I think we face a point where those landlords are gonna be held accountable by individual employees. And in the same ways that if you, uh, if you went to a restaurant or a food, uh, food store, you might look and pay reference to the, um, the food safety standard notice that would be posted uh, just next to the front door. I wonder the extent to which employees are going to be asking their employers how healthy those buildings are. What are the air filtration system ratings? What is the fresh air supply? What happens if there is a COVID case reported in one of the other uh, cohabitant spaces? Does the building close? Do they prohibit you? Um, do you have to stand in a queue and have a security guard taking your temperature every morning? It's going to be very public for a very long time. And I think this is where the employee is going to be empowered. And that's a trend that I would say we're going to see a rapid acceleration to the idea of a, uh, an employee who expects more of the building, regardless of whether that's the, you know, their employer, the front of house hospitality staff or the landlord. No, I, I think that's right, Tim. I also think that certainly many of the landlords that we've been working with in New York um, are aware of their increased obligation and their opportunity, right? Because to the extent that they recognize the obligation to ensure safety of arrival into the building and the opportunity to be better connected with the tenant, to give healthy building signals, to really leverage technology in a way, I think is also gonna to start to pivot around how we think about privacy of data, right? And sharing of data around how individuals are healthy as part of an ecosystem within a building. So I think we're gonna learn a lot over the course of how landlords begin to um, share data around their buildings and then our willingness to participate in that, in that kind of ecosystem. So um, Andrew, I mean, you're in a business that's highly regulated, right? And um, there was reason why people were together and there were very strict rules about who could talk to whom and how you divided, divided them up. How, how do you see that evolving through this process? I mean, as we know, one rogue can, can tank a business like yours. Um, sure. I mean, I, I don't know how specific I can answer that at the moment, but the, uh, it, it certainly is one of the key parameters in, in financial buildings, right? That there are regulatory requirements that are, are need to be met. Um, and so I, I think there's, there's a broader question that's going to be asked by at a societal level. I, I don't know if any one business could answer this because it, it is part of following a broader series of governmental regulation, et cetera. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have a specific answer to the, the future on that yet, but the, I think the key question is, is are there ways um, longer term of, of meeting those regulatory requirements um, in new ways? And I, I don't think that that's going to be answered by an individual business. I think that's going to be the industry and sector, right? Uh, it, it is a governmental question. Uh, so I, I honestly, I don't have a, a, a pure answer for that at the moment, but you're right. It is going to, it's still going to be a key parameter, just like it, it has always been a key parameter for our spaces. So I, I, think, Todd, I, I think that'll be answered by the first financial services Institute that has a data breach of any magnitude as a result of somebody being at home or traveling to and from home with a device that they'd previously been uh, disallowed. So I think, uh, you know, the future will tell us what happens based on, whether the existing systems remain robust and, and, and tight. And we're getting toward the end here, but there are really questions, more questions about what end users are looking for. I think, um, you know, Google obviously was early in looking at 
sort of the mid-rise buildings from Chelsea and, and farther south. I mean, do you think that, that we'll see even more of a shift toward that, those sorts of buildings? I mean, there aren't a lot of available and away from maybe some more high-rise buildings in the city, Paul? So Todd, you actually broke up in the middle of your question, so I'm gonna ask oh. you to repeat it. I'm just, the, the buildings that you've moved toward in Chelsea, the Chelsea markets and the, uh, the sort of mid-rise buildings, do you see that that will be something you'll continue to look at versus high-rise buildings? Did you do that? Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a little bit indicative of the, the way we think about space. And so to the extent the, the characteristics of the buildings in Chelsea, the, you know, we, we still have issues of vertical circulation that we need to address. But um, I think in many cities, we do have high rise solutions because they're the only available kind of real estate asset that, that exists. So, so, but I think we will, well, there's the part I love about working from home the most. <laughs> All the things one can control. So, so I think on a case by case basis, we will be much more, you know, there'll be scrutiny around the asset classes that we look at and then how do we continue to provide, um, control those in different ways, multi-tenant buildings where we are owner and, and are in control of the entire asset is going to be very different, right? Um, all right. And I think that we have time to sort of have some final comments from everyone. Um, and Andrew, is there, some broad thinking to wrap this up. Oh, I, I mean, I think that the broad thinking on this all comes back to the, the processes that we're gonna take away uh, over the, the coming months. I, I honestly think it's the most important takeaway in any of these conversations right now is um, how each organization is going to define the questions it has to answer moving forward. Um, and it does, uh, I don't even mean to harp on this, but it does mean, that if if we're not listening to the very specific concerns of our own of our own staff of our own people of our own businesses um we're not each organization won't be able to define uh, an answer that's tailored to their needs moving forward and it's not very different than other other design questions that have been over the last 10 years it's just this is a very challenging series of questions and so it just puts it in the heightened relief how important that that establishment of a clear process for an organization to meet these answers long term. It, to me, it's the most fundamental piece of the whole puzzle. Kim, and then, and then Paul, could you just follow on that? Just a minute and a minute. <laughs> yeah, I, sure, I, I think it's right. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's it, there's no easy solution. It's there's some incredible hard work that's needed. I think, you know, strategists need to really prove that they understand what the word strategy means and start strategizing. Uh, every workplace entered this, um, you know, with different susceptibilities and different capabilities, different vertical distribution, different occupant densities. So simply plucking numbers from the air and implementing that as a strategy, I think that that's the real challenge. Organizations have actually got to dig in, do some damned hard work, make some tough decisions, communicate well, listen superbly, Oops. and see what happens in the world, right? Because it's changing very quickly. Paul, and then Stephen, do you follow up? Yeah, I think the only thing that I would add to that, both of those comments, is the, the uh, really providing choice, because that is what I think is going to be most important, particularly as we move through this over time, and it evolves, because it's very much, we are early, and it is going to evolve, and so how do we continue to drive choice for our employees and provide the right options for them in terms of being productive at work? Well, listen, thank you very much. I, um, when we were all together talking about these questions, we, I think, could have gone on for a long, long time talking philosophy. I hope that we answered some questions for the, for the audience and that everyone found this of interest. And Stephen, are you going to wrap it up for us? Great. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, just thank you very much to the panelists, Andrew, Paul, Tim, and Todd. Um, great, great conversation and great insights. Um, I think only time will tell how this all plays out, but let's not waste a crisis. Um, so SPP is back again next week. Um, we're going to have to get ourselves a jingle um, to discuss um, project delivery. And we might just um, extend the peace of mind theme into projects to make it a trilogy. Um, so we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Tom, Tommy for any final comments he might want to make. 
Thanks, Stephen. Not much more to add there. Again, just want to echo the thanks to our panelists and our moderator, Todd. You guys did a great job. This is a great follow up to last week's presentation. And just for everybody else's edification, uh, this plugged in series will continue next week with the owners rep panel. And there was a lot of questions today about uh, Asia. We have a panel specifically dedicated to lessons learned from the return to work in Asia the week thereafter. Uh, a lot more on our website. So thanks to everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Stay safe. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.